It's, it's, it's 103. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar conducted by the Office of Child Support. My name is uh, Raghavan Vardachari, the Division Director for the State and Tribal Systems. Um, <clears throat> this session is being recorded. So if anybody objects to it, it's connected anytime now. Um, some housekeeping tips. Please ensure that you mute, except while asking a question. And please post questions in the chat box. Um, do not post any welcome messages or any other messages into the chat box because it becomes difficult for us to sort through the chat and uh, get to the questions. Uh, so, as so a as general, general rule, rule, we'll be taking questions at the end. There are three presentations today, so we'll take the questions at the end of all the three presentations. You, the, there are two ways to ask the question. You can raise your hand and Aisha Gaskins will mute your uh, profile. At that point, you are uh, free to ask the question or you can type your question in the chat box. Slides and recording for this presentation would be available at a later date on the OCC or um, th this is for people that missed the webinar or for your own reference. So about, about this uh, presentation, um, about a year and a half ago, OCSC embarked on a journey to train and educate our state partners on full life cycle, uh, beginning with uh, advanced planning documents, APD 101, 201, followed by the streamlined feasibility study and then we moved on to the certification of state systems, verification and validation. And today's session is on procurement and quality. There was no particular order in which we did those webinars. It was based purely on the interest expressed by the state partners. <clears throat> we worked with the NCCSD, Systems Committee meeting uh, with Carla West, Robin Arnell, Jim Fleming, and others to come up with the relevant topics for these kind of webinars. Moving on to today's topic and the presenters. Um, the first presentation is on procurement, presented by Natalie Njoku. Natalie is a federal DSTS analyst who has worked with many of the states uh, who are on the call today. Some of the states include Georgia, Massachusetts, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Vermont. I'm not going to read the entire list because there's too many. Tevlin Thompson is also a federal analyst, worked with many states, including Texas, Wyoming, New York, New Jersey, and Guam for some, some of the states that she worked on. Our third presenter is our guest speaker for today. He's uh, Mr. Chris Thonius. He is the chief information officer for the Attorney General of the District of Columbia. Uh, I will read out uh, Chris's bio before he starts beginning his presentation after Tevlin has completed. Without further ado, I will turn it on to Natalie Njoku. Thank you, Raghavan, and good afternoon, everyone. Next slide is the... Um, I think Raghavan already covered this slide. Can we move to the next slide? Okay. In this section of the webinar, I will discuss applicable federal procurement standards, procurement models, prior approval requirements for procurement documents, key RFP and contract context and potential options to explore, to reduce risk and cost. Uh, like Raghavan said, we held the state symposium back in 2019, and these slides were presented then. We have made some minor changes, but most of you who attended the symposium have seen most of these, so think of it as a refresher. I have also included several CFR citations throughout the slides for further details and reference. The discussion today is centered around single program requests. However, these procurement standards are applicable to multi-program requests as well. 
So procurement, procurement and acquisition is used interchangeably. And it basically just is the acquiring of ADP equipment and services from commercial sources and from state and local government resources. The federal standards that apply to procurement include, but not limited to, 45 CFR Part 92, 95, 75, and 307. Of course, there are some FAR guidelines as well that apply. Additionally, states may follow their own procurement standards in areas such as sole source and conflict of interest, as long as it follows the same policies and procedures it uses for procurements from its non-federal funds. So there's a caveat there. OCSE may ask for affirmative attestation from authorized state requester that state procurement standards are being followed. And lastly, OCSE retains authority to provide oversight if the state's procurement policy is an impediment to competition that could potentially impact project costs or risk of failure. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk about procurement models. All procurement transactions must be conducted in a manner providing full and open competition consistent with federal standards, whether it is formally advertised or negotiated. Open competition gives states a wide range of options, reduces cost, ensures objective contractor performance, and eliminates unfair competitive advantage. It also results in best value. Contract is usually awarded to the firm whose proposal is most advantageous to the program. OCSE reviews procurement documents to ensure restrictive comp competition provisions are absent. Example, conflict of interest or requiring unnecessary experience. An example is contractors that develop the specs for your statement of work or RFPs must be excluded from competing from the procurement. Another procurement model is the master services contract. And generally, uh, the, the process is procurement is released, procurement released for all required services to multiple vendors on a master contract list. Vendors will submit proposals for areas they are qualified for. States will then select multiple vendors for each type of work. The task order is released to multiple vendors for a specific type of work. And finally, the task order is awarded to one vendor. There has been a growing trend in state procurements in the use of master services contract for procurements of equipment and services that are acquired repeatedly. A master contract to qualify vendor does not require prior written approval from HHS. A master contract to, to qualify vendors does not require prior written approval from HHS. However, if FFP is requested when the state seeks to acquire products or services from that master contract, then the master contract needs federal approval and the task order for the services of the product to be acquired needs prior federal approval. So there's a difference between federal approval and prior federal approval. At the point when task orders are to be issued to qualify vendors on the master contract to secure competitive price quotes, HHS requires three things, a copy of the RFP, that was used to qualify vendors on the master contract, the master contract itself, and the proposed task order to assure that the state followed competitive procedures. The review of RFP and resultant master contract is a one-time review for federal approval. Therefore, prior federal review and approval requirements would not apply to the master contract, but would apply to the subsequent task orders issued against the master contract. And, a, and an acquisition that uses an approved master contract does not require sole source justification as long as, it's a caveat, as long as the federal review of both the contract and the task order determined that the state allowed multiple eligible vendors on the master contract an opportunity 
to bid, even if only one vendor on the qualified list provided a response to the task order solicitation. However, any attempt by the state to direct procurement of service or product to a specified vendor on the approved master contract list will be considered sole source procurement. And this will require sole source justification. So I have provided IM0502 because we do get a lot of questions around master services contract. When is prior approval required? Is the contract required? I've provided that reference there for, for you and for you to, uh, for further guidance. Next slide, please. So SOAS is another procurement model. And this is basically when an item or service is available only from one source. And this could be for several reasons. Could be that the procurement document is sent to only one vendor, only one source for the product or service. Solicitation was attempted, but only one vendor responded. It could also be that after solicitation of a number of sources, competition was determined inadequate. So there could be different reasons for this, or it could be in an emergency situation. But sole source requires an approval criteria, and that includes that the state's own procurement laws must support the use of a sole source contract. The state must provide written justification. OCC authorization is required. And of course, I talked about if it's an emergency situation. Next slide, please. Multiple agency procurement vehicles. We're seeing a growing trend here as well. Contract is shared among state agencies and uh, agencies such as you know, uh, Child Support, CMS, Students Bureau, FNS, and the cost is allocated across the agencies involved. And in each agency's APD, the cost is reported there. So we're, use, we're seeing a lot of this um, enterprise project, multi-program projects for shared services, shared platform infrastructure, cloud solutions, consolidation of data centers, migrating of legacy data centers. We're seeing a lot of this in, this, in the state space. The next type of procurement model is the intra-agency agreement or cooperative agreements, some call MOU or service agreements. And an example of this is when one state agency is providing quality assurance services to another agency. Next slide, please. Prior approval requirements. Like I said, there's a difference between prior approval and, 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 and approval. So prior approval before the acquisition is um, completed, you, you, you send the request to OCSE for prior approval review. A state must obtain prior approval from the department when the state plans to acquire ADP equipment or services with proposed FFP funds. So if you don't plan to use FFP funds, then prior approval is not required. But if you do plan to use proposed FFP funds, um, prior approval is applicable in these scenarios. One, when cost thresholds are met. Software development acquisitions of 6 million or more for competitive acquisitions requires prior approval. Non-competitive acquisitions of software development of 1 million or more. Hardware cost development, uh, sorry, hardware and cost software acquisitions of $20 million or more requires prior approval. Or OM acquisitions combined with hardware or cards or software application requires prior approval. Prior approval is also required when the acquisition summary does not meet, does not, you don't have that on the screen, when the acquisition summary does not meet the criteria specified in the APD. Prior approval is also required if it's an initial acquisition for a high risk activity such as development replatforming, et cetera. Contract amendments within the scope of the base contract involving contract cost increases, which cumulatively exceed 20% of the base contract costs. So if you have a contract amendment of 5% increase in costs, it does not require prior approval, um, but you do need to keep track of the contract amendments because when you hit that 20% threshold, you will require prior approval review 
from OCSC. For non-competitive acquisitions, including contract amendments, when the resulting contract is anticipated to exceed 1 million, the state will be required to submit a social justification in addition to the acquisition document. Next slide, please. Let's talk about exemptions. Acquisition checklist is a standard HHS checklist that states can submit to self-certify that their acquisition meets federal and state procurement requirements. We also have exemptions in emergency situations, for example, natural disaster COVID. And, and what, is, what is considered an emergency situation when there is a need to acquire ADP equipment or service in order to continue the operation of the child support enforcement program. In this case, the state needs to describe the harm, or it could be that the need could not have been anticipated or planned for, and the state was prevented from following prior approval requirements. Maintenance and operations. The final rule state system APD process published in the Federal Register, effective on October 2010, eliminated the prior approval submission requirements for operational procurements, regardless of the size of the contract. Please note this is different from what we talked about in the previous slide. This is strictly operational procurement. What we talked about in the previous slide was Operation O&M contract acquisitions combined with either hardware cards or software development applications. Those require prior approval. And lastly, service agreements. And I provided the reference here, they are exempted from prior approval requirements. Exceptions in the IVMV, independent verification and validation. The acquisition document or contract for required IVMV services, because not every project requires IVMV services. So the acquisition document and contract for required IVMV services must be submitted to OCSC for prior written approval. There are no exemptions or waivers for IVMV. Please note that acquisitions, whether exempted from prior approval or not, must comply with federal provisions, okay? Or you submit an acquisition checklist. And lastly, we do have provisions for waivers. State may apply for a waiver of any requirement in subpart F of 45 CFR 95 provided there by presenting an alternative approach. So please reference the regulation citation there for detailed information and the process and procedure for um, requesting a waiver. Next slide, please. Prior, appro prior approval process. State need to submit procurement documents to HHS prior to acquisition. We talked about this earlier. OCSC requires 60 days to review. OCSC does accommodate expedited reviews. For rare situations, please consult with your federal analyst, but regulatory requirements is 60 days. If a state acquires ADP equipment or service without obtaining prior approval, FFP will or can be denied. States may request reconsideration of the disallowance of FFP by a written request to the head of the federal program office within 30 days of initial written disallowance determination. So within 30 days of getting that letter, you can request for reconsideration. There are certain conditions that, that OCSC will examine to determine if he may grant the request for reconsideration. And I provided that uh, reference there. But please note that one of the conditions of the reconsideration is whether or not the state has a record of recurrent failures to comply with the requirements to obtain prior approval. Next slide, please. 
So here we're going to talk about key RFP and contract sec sections. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, of course. There's so many um, contract provisions that you need to have in your contract. But I wanted to just touch on a few of these. Statement of work. Contract should, to, should describe in detail the scope of work. It should talk about the roles and responsibilities of all the parties involved. Evaluation factors. What is the selection criteria and the weight of each factor? Um, federal funding. There should be a statement in the procurement document that says contract is contingent on, contingent on state and federal funding. This is where your termination for convenience becomes necessary. Then, of course, there are several federal clauses that need to be included, and this is just a few. Software and ownership rights. Who owns what exactly? Especially when you're dealing with proprietary software, where the software is owned by the vendor. Then we should include data ownership clauses in such cases. What about confidentiality clauses? That should include security and privacy clauses and requirements, access to system records, access to records, record retention clauses that provide for record retention for at least a minimum of three years, and other um, several pro procurement federal pro pro provisions as well that need to be provided in the contracts and the RFPs. Next slide, please. Termination for cause and convenience. We talked about convenience a little bit earlier. And this is required for contracts uh, in excess of $10,000, termination for convenience. What about um, administrative, contractual, and legal remedies for dispute and damages? Our contracts should have ways to resolve disputes, breaches of contracts. What constitutes the breach? How are we going to handle that? Contract changes, is it allowed? How will it be handled? By whom? What is the process? Then this one is the big one, performance measures, holdback clauses, final system acceptance and warranty period. We need to clearly define our acceptance criteria and performance measures thresholds. What are we willing to accept and not accept? What will be the performance monitoring uh, techniques? Uh, are we gonna use EVM, QAS, ETC, transition, Knowledge transfer, system transfer to state. The vendor will eventually leave. State needs to be prepared, ready, and capable, and capable to take over. These provisions need to be in the contract. And lastly, federal system certification provisions should be in the contract as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but the question then becomes, are there potential options to reduce risk and cost, because we do know that the regulation provides OCSC the authority to recoup, to recoup federal um, funding from failed system projects. And then we also want the state to be successful. So we talked about shared enterprise services earlier. Um, like I said, there's a growing trend. A lot of states, you do see this multi-program endeavors going on, sharing the architecture and platform and infrastructure. Um, conducting market research and independent cost estimation, um, automating your processes as much as possible and utilizing innovative technologies and, and strategies. Some states are, are venturing and using agile software development lifecycle now. From Fox Space Prize, yes, we are transferring the risk to the vendor, but we need to clearly define our acceptance criteria and performance measures threshold for all deliverables involved. We need to think about including uh, performance-based incentives or disincentive in the, in, the, in the contracts. Master services contract use, we talked about that earlier. A lot of states are using that as well. Inclusion of small business companies, I believe DC is gonna talk about their experience. But we also have should we use shorter base period with option years versus a longer base period with option years for contracts? What works best for us in our environment? And of course, you don't have this here, but I, I thought about this cybersecurity insurance policies. You know, the security landscape has changed and a lot of people are including this now to cover, uh, to, to mitigate risk. And of course, a well-written contract, we just talked about having a very strong well-written contract as well. 
So as we think about ways to manage your multi-program and multi-year, multi-million dollar project, we have to constantly think of how we can um, reduce risk and cost. And I hope some of these will be helpful as you go down that journey. That brings us to the end of this section. We will take questions like Raghavan said at the end of the webinar. I will turn it over to Tevlin Thompson, who will discuss quality assurance. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to discuss quality management. If you can move to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, with quality management, it involves planning, um, doing, checking, acting to improve project quality standards. And I'm going to talk more about that in the next slide. And also too, in more detailed, um, we talk about the three processes groups of quality management, which is quality planning, quality assurance, and quality control. And I'll get more um, in details with that. Can we move to the next slide, please? This next slide talks about um, the planning and doing. Um, this is part of the quality management functions. And then, so it involves planning. Planning is assesses the project's current level of quality where that level needs to be and then develops an effective and workable plan with specific targets for improving quality. Then we talk about do. Um, doing implements the plan solution or change. So this talks about the plan solution of change with what you'll be doing, um, testing and processes. Um, then we talk about checking check reviews and evaluates the results of the implemented change and its effects on project quality and ensures that there are no negative consequences. Then it gets into act. Acting takes action based on what was learned from implementing and evaluating the plan change. So we can move on to the next slide, please. So now we talk about quality planning. Exactly what is quality planning? Quality planning involves identifying which organization or regulatory quality standards are relevant to the project and how to satisfy them. Um, it identifies the um, appropriate quality metrics and measures for standards. So you get into the metric and measures for standards for project processes, um, product functionality, regulatory compliance, requirements, project deficiencies, project management performance. It, def it defines how you would measure the quality and it is how to make the product correctly. If we move to the next slide, please. So the next slide talks about quality assurance. Exactly what is quality assurance? Quality assurance is the application of plan systematic activities to ensure that the project will employ all processes needed to meet requirements. Quality insurance provides the confidence that the project Quality is in fact being met and has been achieved. Is the process determined if a product or a service meets specified requirements? If we can move to the next slide, please. So then we talk about quality assurance process. So what is the quality assurance process? Um, the process focuses on um, the, using a quality checklist, which I'll show you an example of a checklist. Um, it talks about um, attending project meetings, um, interview stakeholders. Sometimes people use like a stakeholder checklist 
to see who the stakeholders are and make sure that you have all stakeholders involved and what the stakeholders' um, needs are. So there, um, there is, you know, you can use a stakeholder checklist. Um, is process standards, um, process documentation, and also to um, project audits. So we can move to the next slide. The next slide is an example of a quality checklist. And this would be good to use to make sure that you are not missing in anything, that everything um, that is being checked off. Um, and this would be good, you know, for um, audits there, you know, uh, when, when you have the state has an audit, they can make sure that certain things have been checked off and certain things are in place and that nothing is actually being missed. It can move to the next slide, please. So now we talk about quality insurance contractor activities example. And this is just an example what some of the um, contractors would be involved with, but it's not limited to the following. Um, a lot of the contractors or either the states would develop a quality um, insurance plan to make sure you have uh, that plan in place. Um, also to, it would make sure that um, they provide a narrative description of quality insurance measures applied to, um, to the de deliverables, um, provide project information required for quality insurance monitoring to all stakeholders. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you could have a stakeholder checklist to include you know exactly what you're looking for and this um, for all stakeholders. Also to conduct um, quality assurance reviews as a precursor to the IBMB reviews. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, the difference between the QA reviews, which is directed by the state, and the IBMBs, uh, IBMB reviews, which is basically independent. It's an independent review. Uh, not directed by the state. Go next slide, please. So then we get into the best practice of quality insurance. Um, you want to make sure that you have a very good testing environment. Um, we want to make sure th that um, they are selected on um, release testing. Um, it's important to prioritize, you know, the bug fixes and also to, is, um, to allocate resources for security and performance testing team. So when you get into quality insurance, um, you get into a lot of the testing um, for quality insurance. Um, next slide, please. So then you get into exactly what is quality control. Quality control uh, should be performed throughout the project's life cycle and involve monitoring and controlling project results to determine whether they comply with defined quality standards. And it's a common practice to determine quality measurement thresholds that identify when and what corrective action may be needed to eliminate causes of unsatisfactory project um, performance. The practice of quality control focus on areas such as prevention, inspection, and tolerance. And the main outcomes of quality control activities include acceptance, decisions, rework, process and adjustments. Next slide, please. So now we get into quality control versus quality insurance. So quality assurance is a set of activities that's focused on providing 
assurance that quality requests would be achieved and quality controls a set of activities focused on fulfilling the quality requested. So quality control is used to verify the quality of the output and quality insurance is the process of managing the quality. Next slide, please. And here you can see some side by side about quality insurance where, and quality control where quality insurance aims to avoid the defect. Quality control aims to identify and fix the defects. Quality insurance is a proactive measure and quality control is a reactive measure. Where quality control is more of the product, quality assurance is more of the process. Quality control is uh, find the defects like we mentioned earlier. Quality assurance is prevent the defects. Quality control is reactive. Quality assurance is proactive. And quality assurance is performed before quality control. Um, also to quality control activities. Some of the activities from quality control are walkthroughs, testings, inspections, checkpoint review, and then some of the quality assurance activities are quality audit, defining process, to identification and selection, and training of quality standards and processes. Next slide, please. So this is comparison um, between the quality assurance and IVMB um, support services. Earlier, there was a webinar that was given on IVMB, and um, there was a lot of information covered, you know, in the IVMB. But we want to this time um, clarify and also to to um, stress about the importance of quality assurance at the IVMB and the action transmittal ninety eight dash twenty six. In the action transmittal, it says that OCSC would not approve a state's APD unless um, it's evidence adequate quality assurance services. Um, and also to um, the second action trans transmission 99-03, in that transaction, it states that OCSC will be taking steps to ensure that states have adequate quality, quality assurance assistance and requiring states to provide additional information in their APB submission. So the QA provides is, um, is different from the IBMB that um, the QA provides that they work with and under the direction of the state um, so, um, where the IVMD provides are not directly affiliated with the child support project and provide an independent assessment of the project. Next slide, please. So now I will turn it over to Raghavan to um, introduce the um, speaker for um, DC. Thank you, Tevlin. Um, now moving on to our um, guest speaker, uh, Chris Tanius. Chris Tanius currently serves as the Chief Information Officer for the Attorney General of the District of Columbia. A native of New York City, Chris has 20 years of IT experience, including working in finance, wireless communications, and government. Chris has a broad-based background supporting open data, digital transformation, DevOps, and agile implementation and organizational change management. Chris served as the head of Baltimore City Mayor's Office of Information Technology, an agency of 210 employees 
with a $29 million budget from 2012 to 2014. Chris has held a variety of technology leadership positions for the District of Columbia government, including serving as the Chief Information Officer for the DC Public Library. Under his leadership, the library developed the first iPhone, BlackBerry, and Facebook apps for library users. Chris was instrumental in helping the District of Columbia receive $2.4 in ERA Broadband Technology Opportunity Program grant. Prior to joining the District of Columbia government, Chris was a technology consultant for a variety of clients, including Freddie Mac, Deutsche Bank, Prudential Insurance, IBM, LCC International, and Systematics, which is now Fidelity. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Um, uh, I appreciate you having me here to discuss uh, our approach. Next slide, please. So a little bit of history. Um, our modernization journey uh, led us to the strategy of breaking the project into multiple components that could be used immediately after successful UAP. That is, instead of building one um, system that would go live at the completion of the system development, we developed pieces of it uh, that would go live as we finished them. And the CSSD staff, our child support agency staff, would use the new system um, for some functions and the old system for other functions. So a little bit of an unusual um, approach, but it was one that we settled on after an extensive review of what we had to do to modernize and what was the least risky path um, for us to take. Uh, so we chose an agile methodology to implement system modernization. Um, and our uh, development team and also our um, uh, child support stakeholders are used to working like this. They're used to working together um, to iteratively design and test and develop things. So we had some experience with this, so it wasn't a new way of working together. Um, all of us on the project were part of another very large federally funded uh, human services project, and that is the health benefits exchange system. So we had, we came to this, um, many of us without child support experience, but with big federal human services experience. And because of the uh, approach that we were taking, our experience with firm fixed price projects, and the, the potential for rapid change needed as we went along on our modernization journey, we opted to um, use a time and materials uh, approach rather than a firm fixed price approach. So we wrote an RFP um, inviting bids on sets of labor categories for each component of our technology stack. And um, the heart of our project is Salesforce. So for example, um, we, we solicited bids for Salesforce developers, architects, and system administrators. There was a middleware component. Um, so we solicited uh, bids for middleware engineers, architects, web developers, and testers. Um, we also decided that it would be a good idea uh, for us to hire uh, one or two user interface consultants to make sure that what was designed was easy to use, um, flowed correctly, and um, could be put into production with a minimal amount of disruption. So that was part of the um, RFP as well. And finally, um, we, we added two categories for child support SMEs and for analytics and reporting SMEs. So uh, discrete bids for each of those things. 27 companies responded to our RFP, and we went through a process where we, we evaluated um, their past experience doing similar work. And then we also went through a process where we evaluated their pricing based on current and the current rates for the similar services in the DC area. Next slide, please. Uh, 
at the back of our mind, um, we used a methodology that complied with DC law, um, specifying preferences for minority owned local businesses. So every DC agency is required to spend at least 50% of their expendable budget on goods or services provided by locally owned businesses. We all take this very seriously. The attorney general is an elected official. So our compliance with this, um, with this law uh, is measured and scrutinized and enforced. There is an agency within the district government that actually can look over any contract and if the contract doesn't comply with um, with this law, uh, then they can unilaterally cancel it. So they have quite a bit of um, authority, and and this program is one that is really, really, really important to the business, to the district. And it's important to me too because it's resulted in the growth of a very vibrant ecosystem of locally owned businesses that provide technology services. There are a whole bunch of them. Um, the DC government is not their only client. They can get their start by working for the DC government, but a lot of them are real businesses, um, real small businesses that have federal customers and other customers and private customers. So it's a really important program that results in jobs and, and tax revenue. And the aggregate spending total uh, for DC um, in this, program was $1.1 billion. Um, OAG uh, exceeded our 50% um, cap. We spent 69% of our expendable budget on services provided by locally owned business. And a large part of that was because of IT. IT um, spent 90% of its expendable budget on locally owned business. The rest of the agency uh, wasn't able to do that because of specialized needs that they have. So we we helped pull um, the agency over the finish line to compliance with the law. It's a really important law. Um, there are 119 qualified small businesses that provide technology consulting services, and we selected seven of them for this project. So seven of them hold contracts to provide various types of um, labor to us. You think about what we're doing, it's not dissimilar to building a house. There's a general contractor and then there are subcontractors that put everything together. We're not dissimilar to the way this building that we just moved into um, was built. There was a construction project manager and then there were a whole bunch of companies that did HVAC, um, uh, wiring, other things like that. So that's kind of the approach that we've used. We've used it before. And it's, it's been successful, uh, not firm fixed price, but one that we feel like we can manage and one where we can closely control costs and also one where we can make changes if we have to make them really quickly. Next slide, please. Next. So, uh, while we were doing this project, the, the biggest driver of how we did the project and what our scope was and what we were going to do was really contained in the certification guide. That was our roadmap um, to building a system, a system that would work, a system that could be certified, and a system that encapsulated all the functionality that's required by a federal child support enforcement system. Um, so at the time we engaged our IVNV contractor, we thought that it might be a great idea at the same time for them to help us at the same time work towards certification as we were building the system. So that is document all the certification requirements, tie them back to each component, tie them back to code, and um, as we put each component of our system on time, there would be some assurance that what we were doing would uh, successfully be certified. Um, so, the, so the modernization team uses a tool called Jira uh, to track all of our work products, all of our, all of our anything. That's the source of truth on our, on our projects. Um, we're also using it for O&M 
So it's become sort of our repository for all IT related uh, work. We created a custom Jira delivery issue type called Fed Cert Rec. Um, and that was used to label federal certification requirements. Each Fed Cert Rec issue is derived from an individual objective level or low level requirement in the certification guide. For traceability and certification, each objective eventually must look map to at least one feature and at least one epoch. Um, each low level uh, federal certification requirement must map to at least one user story. And um, stories are the lowest level form of, uh, for lack of a better term, requirements in the agile methodology. Uh, so we met, we counted 69 objective level requirements and 405 low level requirements in the child support enforcement systems guide. Uh, the requirements are divided into 10 sections labeled by letter and functional area. Um, each objective and low level uh, federal certification requirement has information about its mapping status and its indication of traceable to deployable code. I was going to take a screenshot um, from Jira of one of our requirements so that you could see what it looks like in Jira. You can see um, when you open up any one of our requirements, where it maps to in the certification guide, which is really helpful for us. It's helpful to know that we're on the right track, and it's helpful to, to know that we've covered all the bases. JIRA, um, being a very extensive tool that has lots and lots of data in it, is, is great for us to use, but because it's so voluminous and, and so extensive, we decided that we were going to create a series of dashboards that could come up to display at an executive level um, all the information that anybody would need about a particular aspect of our project. So we created a dashboard um, to, to measure how well we were doing with mapping certification requirements to mapping epics, stories, et cetera, et cetera. So next slide, please. So this is our, this is our uh, dashboard. And what we did, we used a tool called Smartsheet. Smartsheet integrates with Jira, and we connected Smartsheet with Jira uh, to show um, all of our mapping. Uh, so green indicates that um, that the mapping has has been mapped to features. Blue indicates something has not been mapped, um, and green green is features and epics. Yellow is features, orange is epics, blue is not mapped. So the best status, the status that shows us that we've done everything um, would be green. So, uh, so everything's been mapped, um, but then um, you'll see on the, on the right hand side, we've got completion status. Uh, so because we're at the relative beginning point of our project, you can see that we um, have not completed a lot of these things. A lot of them are in progress. Then for low-level uh, mapping statuses and low-level completion statuses, you can see the same thing. A uh, considerable number of them are not mapped because we just started this, um, but a good number are fully mapped to stories depending on what portion, what functional portion of the certification guide uh, you're looking at. So this is just a dashboard. This dashboard is shared with our OCSC analyst. It's also shared with our IVMD team. They have access to JIRA. They can see anything that's going on in our project, the status of any piece of work at any time, including uh, test cases and bugs, uh, bug fixes, UAT results, anything. But this is just one example of a dashboard that we've created to. Um, to show how we're doing preparing for certification at the same time that we're building out the project. We're hoping that this, by doing this, that this will speed the certification process. We're also hoping it will save us a little bit of money. Um, and it also is a really useful tool for us, an incredibly useful tool for me and for the team to make sure that what we are doing is functionally appropriate, that it's on track, um, and then it will eventually work the way it's supposed to work. 
So interesting, I think this is a very interesting presentation, and there really is uh, a, a connection between project quality and certification and both proactive uh, QA monitoring and reactive testing and, and building out the framework to make sure that what you do is going to work correctly, um, that it fulfills all of the requirements set forth by OCSC for a child support project and that everybody can stay on the same page. So we're really, really excited about this. Our IBMV vendor has been wonderful uh, at, at partnering with us to do this. And um, stay tuned. We hope to have a little bit more information that we can share about our Agile um, certification journey. And I can't take credit for that term. That came from us. And that's it. Thank, thank you, Chris, thanks for the insightful um, approach that you provided uh, that DC government is uh, taking and also sharing your experiences on um, the child support modernization project. Um, as Natalie mentioned, uh, you know, we had this um, state system symposium in 2019. And uh, since then we could not have another one because of the pandemic uh, in the subsequent years. Uh, so in lieu of the state system symposium, we do have um, kind of uh, webinars that talks about, um, you know, um, the state systems. And this is basically a collaborative platform for the states to share each other's lessons learned and experiences while they undergo the development um, experiences, right? I mean, child support projects are uh, of huge magnitude and it's, um, you know, it's easy and um, you know better to share all those experiences that you have gone through while modernizing so others can learn from your experiences and not repeat the mistakes or um, you know um, faults that were there in the project um, again uh, thank you Chris for sharing your experiences um, with that we open up for questions um, when you ask the question please write in the chat box or raise your hand and Aisha would um, unmute you Yes, so there was a question for me about who decides when something is done on the dashboard. Uh, so our project manager, um, we, our, our project manager marks something as done and uh, the IVNV team uh, peri periodically will review uh, what we've done, ensure that we're, we've done it correctly. So the project manager um, marks when something is completed, but as part of IV and V's job, they, they also kind of act as a, a check on that. At this time, there are no other, okay, one question comes in. How does this save time with OCSE? Uh, I can tell you how we think that it will save time, and I'll let I'll let Raghavan or uh, somebody else from OCSC give their perspective. Um, we are pre-preparing uh, to make sure that what we're building will um, encapsulate successful transactions. That we will use data, um, dummy data, to actually measure this and. Uh, I think that this will save a considerable amount of time off of the process because we're preparing for it in advance. How much time um, is something that we'll have to we'll have to determine as we go along. But the general consensus, both from our IBMB vendor and from our analyst, is this could this could shave up to six months off of the certification process. Um, the vendor that we're using, that we uh, I won't mention who it is, but I only mention this because they provide IBMV services for other states, um, and some of them have taken quite a long time. So they are helping us structure this in a way to save time. But the faster we can do this, um, the less expensive the project will be.
Yes, I would, I would add to what Chris said is that um, it definitely saves a lot of time uh, for your IBNV vendor to have the certification compliance checks done in an agile way. So, um, you know, when, when it comes to the final certification, it, it doesn't take as much as it used to take before. Um, back, back in 2019, we showcased Maryland, who also took a similar approach in having the IVNV vendor do the pre-certification checks so the vendor could come and uh, do, the, do the compliance checks, that what meets the federal requirement standards uh, as per the certification guide. And uh, when the federal analyst goes to certify, do, do the full certification, which is the responsibility of the federal government and the federal analyst to certify the system, it doesn't take as much, uh, you know, um, as, as Chris mentioned, it, it could save anywhere between six to eight months for uh, you know certification. If if you all know, the federal certification after the deployment used to take about at least about uh, ten to twelve months, or um, even more, for the level one and level two certifications. And uh, you know after the level one was complete, you had uh, time to fix those uh, findings that were found and uh, communicated to by the federal analyst. And then from that time onwards, you had your development vendor fix those, uh, you know, make, make those changes to uh, make sure that it, it meets the federal uh, certification standards and uh, then come for the level two certification. With this, we hope that, you know, the level one certification when the federal analyst comes, maybe it can be done in a matter of two to three days versus the five or seven days that our federal analyst took to certify the system. And uh, even the level two, we are seeing considerably, we will see a considerable reduction in time when um, you know, we go for the federal certification. At this time, I see no questions in the chat, no additional questions in the chat. Okay. Um, again, another way of asking the question is ask to be unmuted and Aisha can unmute you and you can ask the question. I don't see any raised hands at this time. Okay, uh, so sounds good. Uh, I think uh, we'll, as uh, you know, exhausted all the questions, um, we'll adjourn the session. Again, thank you very much for attending the webinar. And if you have any questions, please reach out to your federal analyst and reach out to me. My email address uh, is slide now that's being currently showed. So if you have any questions about this presentation, any questions in general, please reach out to your federal analyst. Thank you. Thank you all.